Hi friends! I hope you had a great Halloween. What'd you guys dress up as? I was Lucille Ball, so that was fun. We are officially in the month of November, which means it's my fucking birthday month. I count down my birthday all month long, just so you guys know. If you guys want to give me a present, here's a couple things that I would like. For one, you can always send me monies for beer. On the Broken Limelight website, if you go to the info about the host, there's a link that says buy me a beer and you can literally send me beer money for my birthday. Another thing you can do for me is, if you follow Ash and Elena from the Morbid Podcast or like if you're a Patreon of theirs, do me a favor and tell them about Broken Limelight. There is one more thing you can do for me and also for you. You can go to BrokenLimelight.com and buy some merch. There's tons of items like shirts, hoodies, face masks, phone cases, shit like that. So for today's episode, I'm going to tell you about the murder of Scott Amador, who was a guest on the Jenny Jones show. The murder didn't actually happen on the show, but the show definitely played a role. The Jenny Jones show was a 90s talk show. It was along the same lines as Ricky Lake or Oprah. The show was hosted by Jenny Jones, who was Canadian-American. Before she became a talk show host, she appeared on The Price is Right and Match Game. She was also a drummer in a rock band. And while she was touring with her band in Las Vegas, she was discovered by Wayne Newton. In the 80s, she attempted a career in stand-up comedy. She actually appeared in Star Search for her comedy. In 1991, Warner Brothers invited her to do the tabloid talk show, The Jenny Jones Show. The show started out more serious than it was at the end, kind of like Oprah, but it was getting really low ratings, so they kind of shifted to more unusual subjects like out-of-control teenagers, or they would give someone a makeover, or they would do things like paternity tests. Like, it went from Oprah to Maury, basically. In 1995, Jenny Jones did an episode about secret crushes. The premise was that someone would go on the show and talk about having a secret crush on someone, and then that person who they had the crush on would be revealed to be in the audience. So then that person is like, left with the pressure of being on TV while they decide whether or not to reciprocate those feelings. This kind of thing would become known as ambush television or ambush tactics. The person who appeared on this episode was named Scott Amador. Scott was born in Pittsburgh in 1963. He was a super social guy. Everybody knew him as being a good time. He was a bartender. Scott was gay and some of his friends had the AIDS virus, and he was known to take his friends in and take care of them when they were ill. One day, Scott was heading over to his brother's apartment to hang out, and he ran into his friend Donna, who lived in the same complex. Donna actually had a friend over who was, like, fixing her car, and Scott got a good look at him and thought he was super cute, so he was like, hey, who's your friend? This friend was Jonathan Schmitz. Donna introduced them. She wasn't sure if Jonathan was gay or not, but... Scott met him, and he just thought he was the cutest. He had a huge crush on him, so Scott got really excited when he found out that he could write into the Jenny Jones show about this. Scott was also kind of a flashy guy, so he probably was excited about the idea of going on TV. Scott and Donna flew to Chicago together for the show. Donna was kind of like his wing woman. Jonathan flew there separately. The producers of the show had told him beforehand that the premise of the show was that someone had a crush on him, and it would be revealed on the show. They informed him that the person with the crush could be male or female. Jonathan made it really clear that he would not appear on the show if the person was a male. Had to be female. Since he wouldn't back down, the producers basically told him, well, it could be a male or female, but you don't have to worry. Jonathan had actually been engaged before, and he thought that the person with the crush was going to be his former fiancé. They had broken up just like a few months beforehand. There was also a woman at his job who I guess they had a spark, and he thought maybe it was her. He was actually hesitant to do the show, but his buddies at work were kind of egging him on. So at the end of the day, he decided to do it, and he actually got kind of excited, kind of flattered. It was said that he actually bought like a new outfit and everything, like if this was going to be his former fiance, he was going to make it work this time. The show opened with Jenny Jones talking to the audience, and she says, Which of these ways would you choose to reveal your secret crush to someone? Would you A. Write that person a letter? B. Tell that person in private in case they reject you? Or C. 
Would you tell that person that you're gay and hope that he is on national television? The audience erupted in laughter and cheers. Remember, this is 1995, and homosexuality wasn't nearly as accepted as it is today. In the 90s, gay people were made fun of a lot in media, and a lot of people remained in the closet. But obviously, in the 90s, people didn't understand homosexuality very well, and they weren't very open-minded to it. So before Jonathan was introduced, Donna and Scott were brought on stage. Also, by the way, it's said that producers had been encouraging Scott and Donna to go to the bar and have a few drinks to loosen up before the show. They were given credit by the show to use at the hotel bar, and they had some vodka beforehand. So, on the show, Jenny starts asking Scott questions, and they talk about how Donna introduced Scott to Jonathan. And then Jenny says to Scott, So, I understand that you have some fantasies about Jonathan. And she's, like, egging him on to tell the audience about his fantasy. She's like, You had one that involved a hammock. Tell us about that fantasy. And the audience is all like, Ooh, you know, they're all excited. And Scott says something like, well, I have this pretty big hammock in my backyard. I thought about tying him up to my hammock. And Jenny's like, and? And he goes, and, you know, it entailed whipped cream and champagne, stuff like that. And the audience is just like hooting and hollering. And they like laugh every time anybody says the word gay or like anytime it's implied. Jonathan seems like he's having a good time. Like he's kind of extra. And he was like the type to laugh along with people. But, like, before Scott's even introduced, you already get the impression that this whole thing is, like, really funny to the audience. Because it's a dude with a crush on another dude. And Jenny is loving it. She thinks it's hilarious. And she's like, so what is it that's so exciting to you about Scott? And Jonathan's like, he's got this cute little hard body. He's a tiny, cute little thing. And the audience is just, like, cracking up. And then Jenny says, well, let's see if he is. Let's have John take the headphones off and come out here and see who has the crush on him. Again, you can tell Jenny thinks this whole thing is really funny. Like, the whole vibe is like they're playing a big trick on Jonathan. Like, Jonathan is expecting a super hot woman to have a crush on him, like this woman from work, and then it's really going to be Scott. So Jonathan comes out and the audience applauds, and he gives Donna a big hug and kisses her on the cheek, and then he goes to shake Scott's hand, and Scott kind of pulls him in for a hug, and you can tell that Jonathan is uncomfortable. It's really awkward. Like, okay, first of all, this episode never aired, but I did find a video of some clips of it, so I'm going to post it on the website. But, like, Jonathan is clearly, like, put her there. And Scott pulls him in, and when you look closely, you can tell that Scott is, like, trying to give him a long, intimate hug. He, like, puts his face into Jonathan's neck, like he's going to hold him tight. And Jonathan kind of gives him a half hug and pulls back. Then Jonathan goes to sit in the only empty chair left, which is next to Scott. So they're sitting with Donna on the left, Scott in the middle, and Jonathan on the right. Jenny then says to Jonathan, Did you think Donna had the crush on you? And he replied, No, we're good friends. And Jenny, with this big grin on her face, like, interrupts him mid-sentence and says, Well, guess what? It's Scott that has the crush. And Jonathan says, smiling, You lied to me. And the audience is all like, Whoo! But, like, you can tell when Jonathan is smiling, he, like, covers his face, and it's like, It's like he's trying to be a good sport about it, but he's clearly pretty embarrassed. Then Jenny says, let's play a playback of what Scott said about you before you came out here on stage. Then they played the clip of Scott talking about his fantasy involving whipped cream and champagne. Everyone in the audience is laughing and cheering. And Jonathan is again, like covering his face and he's laughing, but he's (laughs) a poor guy. He's so embarrassed. And he's also making faces like, wow, um. (laughs) <laughs> like, like he just really doesn't know what to say. Jenny then says, Well, Scott's been pretty open about you. He's been having fantasies about you since he saw you under that car. He's been telling us all about his fantasies about you. Did you have any idea that he liked you this much? And he's like, um, no, no. And Jenny says, Can you tell us what your status is? Are you involved? And he says, No, I'm not, but I'm definitely heterosexual. And then the audience starts applauding and cheering. I don't know why, but that sounds scary. Like, what's the right answer here? Like, I can only imagine being in front of a studio audience and being like, shit, what if they hate me for what I say? What if I'm supposed to like this guy back and I'm going to bum them all out? And worse yet, if Jonathan was actually gay or bisexual and just not ready to come out of the closet yet, that would be super unsettling to see that the general public actually applauded and cheered as if, 
him saying that he was heterosexual was the correct answer. Like, if he were to come out as gay, that could have potentially been wrong. After the taping, they all went home to Michigan. Jonathan spent the next evening getting wasted with his co-workers and stayed up the entire night. The next morning, he found a note on his door from Scott. It said, If you really want to get it off, I'm the only one who has the right tool. Some believe that the night John went out drinking with his co-workers, he was actually out drinking and hooking up with Scott. And then the next day, Scott left him that flirty note, and that set John off. Like, maybe John, then sober, felt humiliated by what had happened, or maybe it was the fact that, I don't know, maybe Scott left the note where people could have seen it. Interestingly, Scott's mother also says that Scott and Jonathan definitely got together and had a sexual encounter that night. Jonathan actually had a history of mental illness and alcoholism. In the past, he had locked himself in the closet for days and had also built shrines for former girlfriends. It's believed that Jonathan may have actually have been a closeted gay man. It had been reported by an employee at a gay club called Club Flamingo that Jonathan had been seen in there. He had been seen walking in, walking around, and then leaving. I can understand why people could see that and further speculate that he might be a closeted gay man. On March 9, 1995, just three days after appearing on The Jenny Jones Show, Jonathan went to the bank and withdrew some money. He then went and bought a shotgun and then headed to Scott's mobile home. He sat outside of Scott's house for a little while before he finally knocked on the door. He had left the gun in his car before he went in, and he and Jonathan talked inside a bit. Scott asked him if he was the one who left the note, which he admitted that he did. Jonathan allegedly then went out to his car and got his gun, and then walked back into the mobile home. Scott yelled out to his roommate for help, saying that John had a gun, but it was too late. Jonathan shot him twice in the chest. Jonathan fled, and Scott's body was found just moments later. It was said that there was still smoke coming out of his chest. The shot was made at super close range. Jonathan got in his car and started driving towards his sister's house. Just about 15 minutes after the crime had occurred, he stopped at a gas station and called the police and confessed. He told the operator that he felt humiliated by the Jenny Jones show and that Scott had, quote, fucked him on national TV. Scott's roommate Gary called 911, but by the time they arrived, Scott was already dead. Jonathan admitted to everything, even stating that he decided to commit the murder the moment he saw the note from Scott. It was claimed that Jonathan suffered from bipolar disorder and Graves' disease. Graves' disease causes, like, a a thyroid hormonal imbalance, and some of the symptoms are irritability and irrational, sometimes violent behavior. They claimed that Jonathan was homophobic and that the experience on the Jenny Jones show humiliated him. They called this the gay panic defense, which basically claims that he became enraged and temporarily insane after receiving unwanted sexual advances from another man. Jonathan's father testified and gave insight into their home life. His father was clearly homophobic. And Jonathan apparently told Donna that his parents questioned his sexuality in the past. While on the stand, Jonathan said to a lawyer, Well, how would you feel if someone thought you were gay? So whether or not Jonathan is or was gay, it's clear that he grew up in a home that discouraged it. So in in my personal theory... I'm wondering if maybe he was gay and he was ashamed of himself and everyone around him. Because it's also interesting that he came right out and admitted that he killed him. And maybe he didn't want to admit that he was gay, but maybe he kind of felt like he deserved to be locked up. Or like something was wrong with him. Like maybe that was his way of stopping himself from doing something gay in the future. That's just my theory. I'm not saying it's right. I'm just trying to make sense of this. Jonathan was convicted of second-degree murder. He was sentenced to a minimum of 25 years to a maximum of 50 years in prison. Jonathan's lawyer urged him to sue the show and use all of his appeals. He appealed a sentence in 1998. It was overturned and his case was retried, but it ended up having the same outcome. Jonathan ended up being released in 2017 after serving 22 years. He was granted parole for good behavior. Scott's family also agrees that none of this would have happened if it weren't for the Jenny Jones show. The way they see it, two young men lost their lives that day. Scott's brother was quoted as saying, I do, and some of my family members do, feel that Jonathan Schmitz was only as much to blame as the Jenny Jones show. Their people are criminals for what they did. 
Jonathan Schmitz was sort of like a fall guy in their conspiracy. Jenny Jones show continued until 2003, and Jenny has always denied any responsibility. She said, It was not the Jenny Jones murder, it was the Jonathan Schmitz murder. In 1999, the Amador retained a lawyer and sued the Jenny Jones show, Telepictures, and Warner Brothers for the ambush tactics and, as they put it, the negligent actions that resulted in Amador's death. The jury awarded them more than $29 million. They found that Jenny Jones' show was both irresponsible and negligent, contending that the show intentionally created an unpredictable situation without due concern for the possible consequences. See, Jenny and the producers admitted that they didn't actually ask Jonathan about his mental health or look into his background at all. So they had no idea, like, who these people were before they put him on stage and ambushed them in front of the whole world. Unfortunately, Jenny Jones and Warner Brothers never paid a dime of that money to the family, and Jenny Jones appealed the decision multiple times. In 2002, Michigan State Court threw out the original ruling, stating that the show had no legal responsibility to protect a guest on the show after it aired. Jenny said that she was elated by that decision, and she continues to insist that the Jenny Jones show could not have possibly prevented this murder. I was listening to Morbid Podcasts, they covered this case, and Elena said something that I really agree with. Jonathan is definitely responsible for this. I mean, nobody killed Scott other than Jonathan. But Jonathan was also put in a really hard position, and I kind of agree that the Jenny Jones show acted irresponsibly. I think it's pretty unfair to ambush people like that, and at the very least, not have some kind of psychologist on set, or perform some kind of psychological evaluation on guests before they appear on the show. I mean, for all we know, if it weren't for the Jenny Jones show, maybe Jonathan could have kept living his life, even if he were homophobic. Maybe he would have gone the rest of his life without ever hurting another person. Or maybe he would have found out about Scott's feelings in private and just having that happen not on live television would have just been slightly uncomfortable instead of completely mortifying. Like I said before, the 90s were a really tough time to be gay, and while Scott was very open and proud of his sexuality... Jonathan was just not in the same place. And that's okay. But like, everybody has their own boundaries and their own timelines. It's never okay to out someone or force someone to come out when they're not ready. In the 90s in particular, you couldn't even be bi-curious without people laughing at you or treating you like you were like a monster or something. Or like, particularly for gay men, gay men in the media were 100% of the time portrayed as feminine. Like, as far as anybody knew or saw in the media... There was no such thing as a gay man that was not feminine. And people treated it like a joke. Like, it was fucking funny to everybody. So it was a pretty ballsy move to be out and open the way that Scott was. I mean, I remember growing up in the 90s and being terrified about having homosexual thoughts. Like, it was shameful. I grew up thinking something was wrong with me for having homosexual thoughts. So I can only imagine whether you're openly gay or in the closet or even a straight person for someone to put you on live television and force you to confront that topic, like, that must be mortifying. Even just the pressure of accidentally saying the wrong thing and having the entire world see you making a fool of yourself. In the 2002 to 2003 TV season, The Jenny Jones Show became the lowest rated daytime talk show. It was canceled in the summer of 2003. Like I said, one of my sources for this episode was the Morbid Podcast. There's also another podcast I really like called Hollywood Crime Scene, and they also covered this case. And they did a good job. That's it for today's episode. I hope you enjoyed it. Remember, you can always send me suggestions for cases for me to cover by emailing me at ddwest.brokenlimelight.com or you can go to brokenlimelight.com and click on the Contact Us tab. You can also view show notes, photos, videos all that stuff about today's episode, and you can leave a review or a comment about it by going to brokenlimelight.com. Thank you again for listening. I appreciate you. Bye-bye. Today's episode is brought to you by Hunt a Killer. Hunt a Killer is a monthly mystery subscription box that's truly one of a kind. It's basically like a true crime case in a box. It comes with case files, codes to decipher, detailed backgrounds about the suspects and the victims, there's evidence for you to evaluate, 
It tells an immersive story of a whole crime case from beginning to end. It's kind of like an escape room in a box. You can do this by yourself, or you can team up with a buddy, or you can do it for like a game night or even a date night. You can take a little break from technology and immerse yourself fully into this box, or if you prefer to be a more high-tech investigator, you can join online communities and talk to other Hunt a Killer players about clues and stuff. Hunt a Killer also shares part of the proceeds to the Cold Case Foundation, so your purchase actually helps with real-life cold cases. The best news is that Broken Limelight listeners get 20% off of their first subscription box. So go get started now at huntakiller.com and don't forget to use the code BROKENLIMELIGHT to get your 20% off. That's Broken Limelight, all one word.